Good morning to everyone, um, and thank you for attending this uh, brand bag lunch uh, seminar uh, with uh, Professor Leon Castellanos Jankovic. Uh, Leon is a researcher in the International Law at the Asser Institute and academic coordinator of the Netherlands Network for Human Rights Research. Uh, his work focuses on international human rights law. The history of human international law and minority production. In 2019, his paper Nationality, Alienage and Early International Rights was awarded the inaugural David uh, D. Caron Prize by the American Society of International Law. And previously, he worked as a postdoctoral researcher with the Dutch team in a project on memory laws in European and comparative uh, perspective. He has uh, numerous uh, publications, but I, what I would like to uh, mention in particular, especially for our students who are always interested in the practical side of the work that our speakers uh, do. Uh, he, uh, in addition to his academic work, he has delivered expert legal opinions and workshops at the OSC High Commissioner on National uh, Minorities, at the Mexican Foreign Ministry, and the Center for Constitutional Studies of the uh, Mexican Supreme Court. Now, today, uh, Dr. Castellanos will uh, talk about private law and the making of uh, human rights. He will talk for about 30, 35 minutes. Let me in particular remind those that are online that if they want to ask any questions during the Q&A, that will obviously follow uh, Professor Castellanos' talk. Please put the questions in the uh, Q&A uh, box. So, the floor is yours now. And welcome to SICE. Thank you, Justin. Thank you very much for this very warm introduction, Professor Frosini. And good afternoon, everyone here at SICE, Bologna Johns Hopkins, and watching us online. Before I begin, I would like to thank Professor Michael Plummer for, for the very generous invitation to be here today and to Professor Frosini for welcoming me uh, this morning. I would also like to thank the faculty and Dr. Erika Melchi for coordinating and Alessandra Nakamu and the staff for their logistical assistance. So what I'm presenting here today is work that I have conducted at my postdoctoral project which has grown out of my doctoral thesis, where I dealt with the history of international human rights law. In the thesis, I examined whether the regime of minority protection that was established after World War I, and which was guaranteed by the League of Nations in the multilateral treaty system, influenced international human rights <coughs> after World War II. Now, the short answer to that question is yes. The minority protection regime established in 1919, influenced human rights after 1948 a good deal. In 1919, the protection of minorities was pioneering in that it is internationalized for the first time the legal standard of equality before the law. This is the first time this standard is reflected in an international treaty, specifically in the treaty between Poland and the Allies. The standard of equality before the law would later be featured in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and every human rights instrument after. But I also noticed that the two experiences were profoundly different. In 1919, the international protection of minorities occurred in a select number of states, which had been created on the ruins of the Austro-Hungarian, Ottoman, German, and Russian empires at the outbreak of World War I. And in 1948, the Universal Declaration sets aside the group protection dimension and was not only addressed to minorities, but to individuals everywhere. Now, more recently for this project, I have been trying to understand how policymakers and lawyers started to international rights, international, internationalize rights in the first place in 1919. And being trained, as I was, in public international law, the answer came from an unusual quarter for me, that is, from the field of private law. 
Now, national lawyers or lawyers trained in domestic legal systems are very familiar with this very clear cut distinction between public law and private law. However, international lawyers are trained in public international law. And so it is a little bit counterintuitive for them to think in terms of private law. But the more I looked, the more I found that the drafters of the key human rights instruments, the founding instruments, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, were private lawyers and had expertise in comparative law, private international law, and domestic uh, constitutional law. So this is the frame of where the research has come from. And now I want to uh, share with you some of the findings. I will begin by talking a little bit about the limits of human rights today. And I will show that minorities especially are affected in terms of political enfranchisement, that human rights sometimes fail to fully enfranchise minorities politically in national political communities. Now, once I uh, explain a little bit about that, I want to go into how human rights have entered the field of public law. And specifically, I'm going to focus on constitutions. How is it that human rights have become associated to the notion of public law? And finally, I will reconsider the private law legacies of human rights to explain how it is that from the beginning, human rights were not really meant to enfranchise political communities because of their private law legacies and heritage. In fact, human rights were designed to be applicable in the field of private law relations. And so we see that political enfranchisement that is associated to public law was an afterthought for the founders of the main human rights documents. And this, of course, leads to disenfranchisement and the discrimination that I want to describe to you um, in the first part of the presentation. So that is to what I now turn. And I titled the presentation The Limits of Human Rights because, unfortunately, it is very banal to say that today, members of minority groups and foreigners suffer untold discrimination around the globe. And although it is a less popular statement to say that international human rights law has not eradicated the systematic unfairness that many marginalized groups experience every day is also obvious. In 2019, for instance, a staggering 78% of black adults in the United States believed that their country had not gone far enough in giving blacks equal rights with whites. And here we have a graph from the Pew Research Center of a survey that was conducted in 2019, where um, most of the black population in the US reflects this view, no equal rights uh, in respect to whites. A sizable uh, number of white people also agree with this, but um, the number of black people who agree is more than double. In the EU, we see similar phenomena. Almost one in four respondents of a 2021 survey felt discriminated against because of their ethnic or immigrant, immigrant background in the 12 months preceding the survey. If we scale this up to five years before the survey, the number jumps to half, 50%, as shown in this graph over here. So members of marginalized communities are targeted and rampant economic inequality, the entrenchment of populism, increasing climate change, and the raging pandemic have exacerbated these problems, of course, placing ever more minorities at risk of being excluded from opportunities, enabling them to live the good life. Leon, could yes. I ask a question? Could you help us out with those numbers there? What they mean, what does 24 mean, for example? Sure. So here is, uh, these are percentages. So um, all of these numbers are uh, expressing percentages of people who felt discriminated against here uh, over the past 12 months. So the first. question is, do you feel as though you have been discriminated against? Correct. Okay. Correct. So over the past 12 months, about one quarter on average, and then over the past five years, uh, about half. 
38, 41, 45, almost half of respondents felt discriminated against. So the question is, how has this been possible in the so-called age of rights? Now it is true that when judged against the history of violence, contemporary forms of discrimination are comparatively subtle and almost never involve direct bodily harm, corporal punishment, or obvious impediments to personal liberty. It is equally true that human rights law has succeeded in compelling states to guarantee the personal freedom and security of all individuals residing within their territory. But what about the more subtle means of discrimination which peddle in racial profiling and class undertones? Although these are harder to identify, these violations can be as egregious as the corporal, corporal punishments of old. According to another recent study conducted by the New York Times, for instance, political segregation overlaps with racial segregation in many parts of the US. And these divisions have existed for over a century, the study says, in part to support the federal government's racist housing policies, according to the New York Times. And so the socioeconomic inequalities resulting from these policies need not be spelled out. And yet, more often than not, the everyday suffering of the people affected by these unjust regulatory decisions is never acknowledged or remedied because the targeted groups are usually minorities who have limited economic resources, and importantly, for this research, virtually no political leverage to fight back. Sometimes, states target minorities and groups in less subtle ways. In Europe, for example, several countries, including France and the Netherlands, have introduced bans on the use of headscarves, and Italy has permitted the display of crucifixes in public schools without introducing comparative protections from Muslim symbols. The European Court of Human Rights has validated these policies in the name of secularism in the case of France and through the margin of appreciation in the Italian case, which some say is controversial. So what keeps human rights from achieving meaningful outcomes to counter these forms of discrimination? Or more pointedly, why do human rights often fail to enfranchise people whose systems of value and belief do not correspond with those of the dominant political community. Now, here I want to argue that human rights have a limited role in solving these problems because these conundrums challenge the politics and ideologies underlying the public sphere, whereas international human rights are mainly designed to protect life, limb, and property, that is, entitlements enjoyed within the private sphere. As my research has found, international human rights law has been shaped by the transnational protection of private rights and private property through the medium of private law, particularly as regards the protection of aliens and their contractual relations. In legal terms, this means that the human rights obligations of states mainly involve abstaining from unduly interfering in anyone's private life and providing everyone with a floor of sufficient provision for personal subsistence. None of these rights are seriously compromised in the examples mentioned in the previous um, studies. And yet, many of us feel that their outcomes are deeply unfair. But human rights have structural limitations in capturing the plight of persons outside or otherwise perceived as being beyond the political community of the dominant nation or nationality. And here I'm talking about ethnic and religious minorities, indigenous peoples, non-citizens, stateless persons, migrants, and their descendants. The exclusionary dimension of political rights is sometimes overlooked by human rights lawyers because human rights standards are usually enshrined in instruments associated to public law, such as constitutions, which also deal with political rights. But public purpose should not be confused with political enfranchisement, which human rights alone cannot achieve. This answers to the problematic configuration of the nation state, to which I now turn on this slide, which has historically associated certain groups to governmental structures to the detriment of other groups. 
So the nation state has long been a feature of Western political organization, and it is worth considering its inherent contradictions momentarily to understand the exclusionary devices that it enables. The pairing of a group sharing ethnic, linguistic, and cultural traits, a nation, with the institutional machinery of a government has defined the state for centuries and became consolidated about 300 years ago in Europe. From the start, however, the narratives and mythologies through which chosen nations become states have been an instrument of exclusion. In recent pioneering, pioneering work, for example, Professor Mahmoud Mamdani of Columbia University traces the perceived supremacy of national majorities to John Locke and his idea of toleration as artic articulated in a famous essay that penned in 1689. And for Mamdani, Locke's liberal regime of toleration helped institutionalize the hierarchies between minorities and majorities, a distinction without which the nation state collapses. This distinction is a product, according to Mamdani, of the incoherence of the nation state as a concept, since the purpose of the state is to ensure equality before the law, whereas the nation aims at valorizing its members and their heritage. But the state cannot wholly articulate itself in the national image without compromising the rule of law. And this is where Locke's appeal to tolerance comes in. The state agrees to not discriminate on the basis of nationality so long as minorities accept an inferior status. As a consequence, Mamdani powerfully concludes that, and I quote, the state will never exist in the image of the minority, which renounces any political project that would change the character of the state. Now, instead of contesting the state of affairs, human rights law has fully embraced the concept of minority status as articulated in many international treaties adopted on the subject since the 19th century. This trend is further illustrated in the Windrush scandal of 2018, where de facto British citizens of Caribbean heritage were threatened with deportation from the UK. Other examples uh, include the Dutch tax authorities' decision to subject 11,000 people to additional scrutiny for fraud because of their dual nationality, and Israel's controversial nation state law, which relegates non Jews to second class citizenship. Now, these trends illustrate how the failure to belong to the dominant nation within the state can result in discrimination and the erosion of equal treatment, despite longstanding human rights safeguards. And so what I want to get to today is the fact that the dignitarian justification and the universalism uh, of human rights is no replacement for the political enfranchisement that results from citizenship. As mentioned by Hannah Arendt, and I quote, it is necessary, I think, to distinguish between the private rights we have as individuals from the public rights we have as citizens. These two, the private and the public, must be considered separately, for the aims and chief concerns in each case are different. And although human rights don't really take on this distinction of private and public very seriously, I want to show that this great dichotomy still holds today and that the political freedoms usually associated to the public realm accrue mainly from citizenship and not from human rights. So how have we reached this point where um, human rights have become part and parcel of public law? How have human rights entered the realm of public law? And how have they become a synonymous uh, concept with universalism, human dignity, and self-worth of everyone around the world? Well, it's been a gradual process. Um, and here we have an example of a very famous professor of international law and human rights who was teaching in Columbia University. His name is Louis Henkin, and he passed away in 2010. He was born in uh, 1917 on the eve, uh, during the First World War. And Henkin says that ours is an age of rights, and he extols the uh, universalism of the United Nations 
Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted in 1948, which he says has been approved by virtually all governments representing all societies. Human rights, he says, are enshrined in the constitutions of 170 states today, be they old states or new, religious or secular, atheist, Western, Eastern, and so on. So how have human rights entered constitutions? Here we have a chart of world constitutions from the um, Comparative Constitutions Project, where uh, we see that constitutions are a salient uh, feature, a permanent feature of states throughout history. And especially from 1900 onward, uh, you can see that um, the line representing uh, constitutions, which is the dotted line, closely follows the line representing new states or newly independent states, which is the solid black line. Now, the, um, the columns that are coming out from the bottom represent the number of new constitutions that are adopted every year. So constitution making is a central feature of state-based public law. Now, one, um, I, I think it's also important to mention in passing that constitutional advice has formed an integral part of constitution making and Western actors have had an important role in that exercise, which has also had an impact on the reflection of human rights in world constitutions. One prominent advisor actually was Ivor Jennings, who is known for the so-called New Westminster post-colonial constitutions. And if we go further back in time, we will also encounter Frank Goodno, who in 1912 was a professor of administrative law at Columbia University, and on October of that year, was asked by the Carnegie Endowment of International Peace to advise the Chinese government on constitutional reform with mixed results. Goodno would later go on to become president of Johns Hopkins University from 1914 to 1929. So Western influence on constitution making worldwide looms large and Western transna and transnational expertise. So it should not surprise us then that the UN is also an important stakeholder in this regard. And it's been heavily involved in the constitutions uh, of Cambodia in 1993, Namibia in 1990. And there is actually a, um, uh, a focal point uh, for the creation of constitutions in the UN Department of Peacekeeping and Political Affairs. So, um, here in this other graph, I want to show the incidence of United, uh, thank you, of the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights provisions in world constitutions. How has the UA UDHR class rights, how have these rights been included in the constitutions of the world over time? We see that there is a surge of constitution making after the 19th, during the 1970s and onward. And this would check out with Samuel Moyne's claim that the United Nations uh, Universal Declaration didn't spark a transformative global enterprise at the time that it was enacted. And in fact, might have remained quite marginal on the international scene, only to be revived by institutional actors in the 1970s and US policymakers. The problem with this graph um, is that it takes the United, uh, the sorry, the Universal Declaration as a baseline to read in, uh, rights and constitutions both after 1948 and before 1948. And it does not account for what happened before the Universal Declaration was adopted. What kinds of rights were being enacted in constitutions before 1948? And those rights are all about citizenship, enfranchisement of citizens, political rights of citizens, and also private rights of, of, uh, of aliens. Here, I want to give uh, an example of, uh, of a constitution which incorporates human rights in the way that the um, Comparative Constitutions Project has shown. Uh, the preamble of the Algerian constitution is a very recent one, uh, which has been adopted in the aftermath of protests in 2019 and 2020 that were sparked by the um, 
by a political crisis when the sitting president announced that he was going to run for a fifth term. And a very uh, normal feature in modern constitutions is this preamble here, where the Algerian people express their complete commitment to human rights as special, specified in the UDHR. Now, if we dig a little deeper, we see that the provisions concerning fundamental rights and public freedoms apply to all public authorities in Article 34. Now, these two concepts, if we look at their definition in the 19th century, are completely different. Fundamental rights have to do with private law and public freedoms have to do with public law. And here, constitutions cobble them together in the way that the Universal Declaration also does that. And yet, constitutions are also deeply uh, embed, deeply embed the distinction between citizens and foreigners. Here we see that every citizen enjoys civil and political rights, very expressly uh, stated, but any foreigner shall enjoy only the legal protection of their person and their property. No political rights are set out for the foreigners here. And this again is symptomatic of uh, modern constitutions today. So how does this play out uh, in terms of the legacy of private rights? So I want to spend the last 10 minutes explaining how did it come to be that the first experiences with international rights were enshrined in the Universal Declaration and in some documents that preceded it. And following all of these experiences, I have come to the conclusion in my research that the main rationale behind that had to do with the continuity of legal relations under private law at the transnational level, as opposed to the establishment of a moral universal legal system that applies to everybody, regardless of who they are. To get to the Universal Declaration, I have to start in the middle of the 19th century. Nationality for 19th century jurists was the basis of international law. Here we have the image of a Pasquale Stanislao Mancini, an Italian jurist, a professor of international law in Naples and later in Turin, who was a founding member and the first president of the Institute of International Law. The Institute is a group of experts on international law, which still exists today, and it's very influential in the development of rules. Many of them go on to uh, draft, have gone on to draft important treaties and um, sit on international courts and tribunals. And to Mancini, nationality is the keystone for international law and for access to um, having rights abroad. But he means this in the context of nationalism in two senses belonging to the nation, and crucially, nationality needs to be attached to citizenship if one is to enjoy any rights abroad. And this was done by a comparative civil law, in essence, comparative private law. And so we see here that the first experiences with the transnational recognition of rights occur in the field of private law and private international law, and not public international law. Here's another example. In 1857, an influential treatise by Hefter says the rights, uh, the, he explains that the private rights uh, that everyone enjoys are the right to civil status, the right to have your marriage recognized, the right of succession, uh, and the right to be recognized as a person before the law. Basically, rights that you need in order to continue your legal relations. Nothing is mentioned of human dignity, nothing is mentioned about natural law. Nothing is mentioned about uh, universal, universal political rights. And these are the, the private or primordial rights of all men, he says, which should not be confused with the political rights of the citizen. With regard to the latter, the political rights, there exists no uniform or generally accepted principle. Their forms and their modifications depend on the conditions of public power. We can find the same sort of statement with François Laurent, who was a scholar from Luxembourg, a Francophone, but also a Germanophone scholar based in Luxembourg, who says 
the political separation of states has no bearing on the enjoyment of private rights. Although it might be impossible for me to vote and become elected in any state, nothing hinders me from holding property wherever I please. The exclusion which acts as a necessary component of political rights cannot be conceivable to private rights. And not only are these scholars arguing for the progressive recognition of uh, private rights anywhere in terms of private international law, they are also arguing that these private rights should constrain states above and beyond their domestic legal systems. And here is an example of that uh, where Demonja, Charles Demonja, who was uh, in the inaugural review of the Journal of Private International Law in 1874, says, above and beyond the civil codes which have been issued by governments, there exists a certain number of general principles whose binding force is equally recognized and applied by all peoples. So there is an emerging consensus by the end of the 19th century that private rights are universal and that public, uh, public law and political rights are much more parochial and inward looking. The minorities treaties uh, in 1919 adopted this schematic distinction between um, private rights and public rights as well. They established three layers of protection for the persons residing in the minority states after World War I. The first layer had to do with the protection of all inhabitants, including aliens, protection of life and liberty. All citizens enjoy equality before the law and civil and political rights, and national minorities had special measures of protection. Again, a very clear cut distinction between nationals and citizens enjoying political rights, civil rights, and foreigners not enjoying them and only having the right to their protection in terms of life and liberty. Fast forward to 1929, uh, the Minority Protections Treaties were, were adopted uh, and, and um, by 1939, they became a dead letter. Uh, but in 1929, and interestingly uh, for us, and related to the minorities treaties, the Institute of International Law, to which Pasquale Mancini uh, was, of which Man Mancini was the first president, adopted a resolution called, uh, in New York, called the Declaration of International Human Rights. Now, international lawyers uh, uh, believe that this was the first modern declaration of human rights, since its features are basically found in the 1948 Universal Declaration adopted in the United Nations. But the person who drafted it was Andre Mandelstam, and Mandelstam was an expert on minority protection, that, uh, on, on the system of minority protection that was established in the League. So here there is continuity between people involved in the crafting of the minority treaties and the um, New York Declaration. They met in New York at Rarecliff Lodge the first time the Institute was meeting in, in the United States. And Article 1 of that declaration says that in every individual, again using the Lockean language, has an equal right to life, liberty, and property, without distinction as to race, nationality, sex, language, etc. So again, the fundamental private rights that we've identified in uh, Part 2, uh, sorry, uh, just in the, in the slides before. What about public, uh, public rights and political rights? Well, according to, um, to them, political rights um, could not be, sorry, uh, civil and political rights could not be um, granted to, uh, to foreigners and when they thought about extending them to citizens, some members stood back and said, if we use the word citizens for political rights, we will have to include within that concept inhabitants of the colonial spaces. And 
We don't want that. So instead of using citizens, they use the word nationals to refer to the ethnic uh, nationality background of their populations in the metropolitan states. So um, here we see a clear uh, exclusion of uh, people who do not traditionally belong to the political community, as I was mentioning in part one of the presentation. And in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we have uh, René Cassin, one of the main proponents of uh, drafters of the Universal Declaration, who was also instrumental in uh, bringing forward a, a proposition concerning universal private rights or droits civils fondamentaux, fundamental civil rights during the drafting process. And here he is with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt from the US and uh, Charles Malik from Lebanon. Cassin uh, failed in, in, in bringing this proposal into the final draft, but his point was that universal private rights have had such a long-standing tradition, and indeed Cassin was also an expert in private international law, just as Mandelstam was, um, and his idea was that uh, the continuity of legal relations would protect the individuals wherever they were um, with the Universal Declaration. Now, the provision was withdrawn and other provisions were included to, to, um, to essentially have the same effects like the right to uh, legal personality. But the UDHR, as a result, conflates public and private rights and no distinction is made in the text, although it benefits from private, um, although it benefits a lot from the private law tradition. And worse, the UDHR has been uploaded to constitutional instruments, which are eminently public law instruments. And so the problem is that the universal promise of human rights is in tension with the constitutionally defined members of the political community. In other words, with the rights of citizens. And the result is that refugees, stateless, and minorities are discriminated. So to conclude, the first um, point that I want to make with this work is that we cannot rely on human rights for things that they were not designed to do. They were not designed to cover political enfranchisement. And we see that in the development of minority status concepts and counter majoritarianism in human rights courts. Some problems can only be solved by politics. And for the longest time, human rights lawyers and advocates of universalism have tried to carve human rights outside of the political space as non-negotiable things. Now, I'm all for denouncing violence where I see it, including colonial violence and so on, but human rights lawyers need to also come to terms with the fact that any form of claim is subject to political contestation. This applies to the national and the international spheres. And where some see negotiation and compromise, others will see violence. But we cannot live with these binaries. Uh, which are hardwired into us. The reality is messier and binaries get us nowhere. What about duties? Policies should not be geared towards minimum floors of protection and subsistence, but how to meaningfully involve every member of society, including traditionally marginalized communities. The starting point should not be understanding human rights as gifts, as Michael Ignatieff has argued. On the contrary, this reinforces the binary dynamic and frames human rights in the political context as a zero-sum game of winners and losers with no real potential or middle ground. It also assumes that people need us to save them, and we have known for a long time, from anti-colonial to post-colonial political literature, that this is a completely misguided reading um, in today's world. Finally, I think that this presentation, um, sorry, I think that the pretension towards unbridled universalism creates not only false expectations, but even an insurmountable distance between communities. What I mean is that the fact that the relations between persons need to be mediated um, by ideas close to their communities, not by universal concepts. And in this sense, I would like to echo Hannah Arendt's uh, critique of human rights, where she says in 1951, three years after the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at the UN, 
um, we are not born equal. Going completely against what the Universal Declaration had affirmed. She says, we become equal. We are not born inherently equal. We become equal as members of a group, community, a political community on the strength of our decision to guarantee ourselves mutually equal rights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. So let's see if there are any, any questions. Otherwise, I will break the break the ice. That last slide that you showed, Leon, uh, of the comment by Anna Aaron, um, at the end of the day, isn't that really the the, the, the underlying issue? Is the is the, is the principle of equality? Um, because I, I would tend to agree with you that this this wanting to to keep completely separate the realms of public law and private law, I think is, is in many, many ways artificial. There's no doubt that if we look at the historical evolution of those fundamental rights that end up codified in constitutions, a lot of it has emerged through, through private law, and in particular, the right to property. But what, is, what has ended up playing an, an, an enormous role is the idea of equality, because if we, if we go back to medieval times, we had, we had Lex Mercatora. Mm -hmm. We had, we had all sorts of situations where, you know, trading, commercial law, and so on and so forth was not affected by, by the borders of states and so on and so forth. But who were the individuals that were involved in that? There were a whole, there was, there was a whole series of people that were completely excluded because they didn't have any access to property and so on and so forth. So, in the end. My impression is that the principle of equality is really the elephant in the room in the whole of this mm -hmm. of this of this discussion, and it's trying to. And and here, allow me. I understand what you mean by saying right. We're inherently equal. That's what the Universal Declaration says. And it says no, we're not all equal. We we have to conquer this equality over time. Mm -hmm. In a way, let's be honest. Aren't they the two sides of the, of, of the same coin? Um, and isn't what Aaron's saying then the justification for forms of positive discrimination and so on and so forth in order to obtain equality in all, all fields of law, including private law? I don't know whether there are any other questions. Otherwise, I've got plenty. <laughs> I'm happy to start with that, yeah, no. and, and maybe people yeah, go ahead. online would like to to chip in. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Professor Prozini. That's, I think that's a very fair point. Uh, the fact that equality permeates the entire uh, timeline that I've set out for you today, and perhaps uh, needed a little bit more attention. And what I'll say about that is that. Um, equality has this, well, the way it's been adopted in human rights instruments, as you know, is a very incremental way. It's this incrementalism. So if you look at the 19th century, it's about um, equality in terms of professing one's religion, equality in terms of um, being able to speak one's language in public spaces, equality of access to uh, resources of the state. So it's all piecemeal forms of equality. And then after 1945, 48, now it's equality before the law, which is enshrined in the Universal Declaration. Um, now, the reason why we need equality before the law is um, inherently what I think. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I think we do need that. I do think we need that incrementalism in order to create uh, a space for a political conversation about what comes next. Uh, I think communities uh, who feel marginalized and left out uh, definitely want to harness that, uh, that uh, promise of equality. But the question is, when does that become, um, when is that not an option? Uh, 
and when is that futile? And I think that in many cases that I highlighted in the first part of the presentation, the promise of universalism and equality um, finds itself constrained by the design of human rights. Uh, I, I, I think that the fact that their private law dimension is really overbearing and not even mentioned in the Universal Declaration um, without even mentioning you know, that political rights are not uh, part of that is, is very problematic. So equality can definitely uh, move the conversation forward and, uh, and enhance uh, certain forms of protection. But I think that when it comes to political enfranchisement, um, that is a that that comes in a different register that may have to be uh, thought through outside of the concept of, of equality, equal as defined by human rights. Let me come back to this. The Professor Plummer, I think, has a question. Yeah, just to um, yeah. very uh, the next third question, since I know nothing about these topics at all. But I'm wondering if you just give us a quick view, uh, a quick definition of what you mean by human rights. It seems that there's a lot of different things in there that, that need to be unpacked. unpacked. And uh, I guess I kind of follow up Justin's question uh, a bit. I remember Milton Friedman once said, uh, if the state looks for equality and liberty, it will soon find that it has neither. So I'd be interested in your, your thoughts on that. Thank you, Professor Plummer. Um, so great question. What do I mean by human rights? I essentially uh, mean international rules that are adopted in international treaties, which are constraining states um, to provide their inhabitants with certain uh, minimum floors of protection. Uh, so in the sense of international law, I'm very well aware that we can talk about human rights. I had some slides about activism. I had some slides about institutional uh, uh, institutions involved in human rights, such as the UN. But here I'm talking about them in the legal sense. And the whole uh, point of research is to show how this private law dimension has entered the international sphere um, of these international treaties. And what I think is difficult for a, an international lawyer to understand is that these private law guarantees and safeguards um, are very well known in domestic legal systems, travel to the international legal standards, and then come back through international law as treaty obligations enshrined in constitutions and then come back, trickle back down as public law. And I think that process has not really been understood. Um, and it leaves out the complex, a few you know, complexities and it leaves out also the legacies of private law and it leaves out the, um, the purpose of why those standards were internationalized in the first place, which is to ensure the continuity of legal relations of people who are crossing borders and are engaging in commercial transactions. So the main point of my work is to not discard or deny the universalism and inherent human dignity aspirations of human rights. I want to complicate the story a little bit. And I want to say, well, that is all fair and, and, and I think it works for some things. Um, but I also want to show how uh, there's this other trajectory that we really haven't taken seriously, and that can sometimes be problematic. Um, and so it's, it's again, this, this translation from domestic private law to international instruments, um, and then from the, these instruments, like the Universal Declaration, don't really distinguish, make that hard, clear-cut distinct, distinction between public and private. And then these instruments, human rights conventions, essentially, are then enacted in domestic legislation as public law instruments. And it's paradoxical because the origins are uh, of domestic law origins are private, private law concepts. Um, 
and, and this has many implications, which I, I will also have to draw from, but um, so yeah, thank you. And yes, uh, sorry, uh, Milton Friedman, it was, and he says, well, right. And Very it was the right. <laughs> right, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm not familiar with his work on, on economics, and I know that you are, are very much uh, in that field. But um, equality and liberty, we will find none. I mean, yes, it's, I guess that if you scratch the surface, um, that a lot of uh, that these concepts just um, are really hard to to deliver on their promises, as as I mentioned in the first part of the presentation. Uh, Non-national citizens, people who like in the Windrush scandal. Uh, people who are entitled to citizenship in the UK and are expected no. no. they, they didn't realize that the, 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 exactly. Yeah. Um, but the system just uh, by default tries to discard them. So, so absolutely. Um, it's still due to, didn't it, from the UK? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think the Windrush case is a bit of a form of of British exceptionalism in the way they treat the whole issue of nationality and citizenship. Mm -hmm. But we had Rafaela, Professor Rafaela del Sart, who's raised her hand, which oh, means I'm hopeful that she can intervene orally, if I'm not mistaken, and she might be able to do so. Rafaela, are you there? I haven't really typed in the chat. She can't Otherwise, she can't type in the chat. Otherwise, Raphael, if you want to send your, I saw your hand raised. Do you hear me? Oh, we are. Oh, yeah, okay. I had a little bit connect and disconnect and reconnect. So thank you very much for an interesting talk. I was just, I'm also not, uh, I'm not uh, a specialist on, on human rights and, and the theory and the history behind them. Um, I was just wondering whether in, in current discussions on um, on minority rights, whether your research has any, how, could I, how should I put it, some advocacy aspect on that? I mean, is your, in which way does your, may your research contribute to current debates, that you, the insights of your research, how can they contribute to current debates on minority rights in, well, in European states, but not only? Thank you. Great, thank you, Professor. Um, it's a big question, so in that sense, it's very challenging. Um, and but it's but it's a fair question because, as you noticed in the presentation, part of my work argues that human rights standards today, as articulated in the Universal Declaration, are coming from um, legal standards adopted in the interwar period where minority protection uh, was first internationalized. So, um, so I think when, when I was writing that and, and working on that, I was very surprised at how the group protection uh, dimension as a self-standing goal of international human rights um, was very discredited after 1948. So with the uh, with the interwar period and the coming into power of the Nazi party in the early 30s, uh, just to rehearse a bit of the history, because I think it's important, why did minority and group rights get such, um, get, get so, such a bad uh, reputation, which is why the main conventions, uh, at least in the EU space, uh, have been adopted in the early 1900s after you know, the, the Iron Curtain came down. Um, and the Indigenous Peoples Convention, uh, sorry, uh, Declaration of 1917, again, attests to how groups are latecomers to the international normative space. And the reason why that happens is because Hitler instrumentalizes this policy, uh, this minority protection regime in the 30s and in the early 40s. When the borders of Germany are redrawn after World War I, a lot of uh, flanks of the German Empire are sliced off and given to Poland and other neighboring states, which meant that a lot of German minorities um, were left behind, so to speak, uh, in these new states, such as Poland, Czechoslovakia, 
some Balkan states, etc. Um, and Hitler, very uh, a very unknown fact is the fact that he concluded treaties with these new states in order to guarantee special treatment for German minorities, um, which ended up being protected even more in law than the actual citizens of those countries. And so he used this as an excuse to internationalize the conflicts and to basically um, legitimately, according to him, uh, resort to force later on in Czechoslovakia and Poland. So that was a big part of why uh, minorities after World War II minority protection was excluded and human rights take a much more individualistic outlook after uh, 45 and in 48. And some people uh, say, well, it's an individualistic document. I don't think so. I think if we look at the last part, there's a lot about how the individual should relate to society, how the individual and the group relates to each other. But there is nothing about minority protection, even though a lot of scholars, including um, Famously, Hirsch Lauterpacht, a great international lawyer who uh, spearheaded the development of the concept of crimes against humanity. Philip Sands has written about this. Um, he also proposed a continuity of the minority protection regime after World War II, and it failed. Um, now, what does that mean for minorities today? I think that today, I mean, first of all, we should recognize the limits of that. Um, the fact that group protection is not really uh, uh, strongly articulated in international law. Uh, and what I find interesting is that when one looks at modern uh, contemporary political movements, human rights have taken the back seat. Um, and now we have concepts like vulnerability, uh, that the UN repeatedly refers to when looking at children in Syria, elder, elderly persons, and so on. So no talk of human rights. And, and, and I find that interesting. I haven't formed any definite conclusions about it, but, but I think alternatives to human rights are starting to see the light. Uh, one last example, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop here, is the idea of climate justice. Uh, we're all looking towards Glasgow this week and next week to see what happens with the COP26. Uh, but you know, the main movement there is Greta Thunberg and, uh, and her, her allies. They don't really use the language of human rights. And here you have a very broad transnational movement, uh, very powerful, very influential, which does not really articulate its claims in terms of human rights. So, so I think that for groups, I mean, the challenge is how do we translate uh, the political issue into a meaningful claim? And that could be in the language of human rights, um, but it could also be in some other language. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Professor. It's a pleasure to see you. Okay. We are running out of time, but I'm going to abuse of my position as chair to ask you one last quick question. Because I think you've underlined, we've talked about as the last point, universalism and its discontent. So we have a few students online that I know are doing various courses, both in the first and second semester related to human rights. I think of Professor Mancini's course, Professor Finichina's course. And you mentioned early on um, that you, you consider the margin of appreciation that is used by the, the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg is rather contra, controversial. Um, I'm putting this question to you because, in a way, margin of appreciation is a way of attenuating, in a certain sense, that element of universalism, uniformity. So, if you could elaborate on that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Again, a very challenging and difficult one. Um, because the issues uh, that are solved with the margin of appreciation are themselves always quite, quite challenging and politically charged. Well, I think that it is controversial in the sense that uh, it enables states to abridge uh, the universal promises that human rights make. And when the court uh, makes use of it, sometimes it results in unfair uh, outcomes. 
And what I mentioned when I said what, what I meant when I said the court becomes a counter-majoritarian institution, which is which is of course something that Professor Mancini has written about yeah. extensively uh, on Laozi uh, versus Italy. Italy. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think it's very important work, and I think it invites us to ask ourselves, well, to what extent is this the right venue to discuss this problem? You know, whether or not the court was right in legal terms, I, I don't think I need to get into an ex exegetic analysis of that. Um, because I think the more interesting question is, should we be using the European Court of Human Rights to talk about our identity, how we relate to the identity of others, how do we share common spaces, common public spaces? And, and these questions are, um, have, of course, a legal dimension, but um, I think it's healthier to, 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 to have them in the public space. And, you know, let's not use the court as an excuse to not sit down together in the same room um, to think about how can we improve uh, and, and make society a welcoming place for everyone, uh, a fair place for everyone, where everyone can, can be respected. So, so I think, um, yeah, and, and, and I think that's where, where the attention should be, as opposed to, of course, let's scrutinize the court and hold it into account. Um, but let's also think more creatively of how these uh, very sensitive issues can be discussed. And again, I think that the human rights emphasis just puts us in this binary yeah. position. They're either enjoyed, not enjoyed, granted, not granted. Um, and and for, for, the, for the claimants, I think that is very um, terrifying and, 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 and dramatic, especially when they belong to minorities. Uh, so, so there has to be other avenues that, that we can pick up. Thank you very much for that. That could be a topic of another, of another webinar in itself. Very, very interesting. Uh, Dr. Kostanianos uh, Jankovic, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leon. It was great to have you. And uh, thank you to all of those that were online or here in the room following us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs>